You have what? I have marshmallows. That's good to know. Are they I'm good sure marshmallows? They taste like self-loathing and hatred. <laughs> I have heard that before. But do you put them in hot chocolate or coffee or anything else, or you just eat them plain? Yes. All the things. All right. But uh, we're not here to talk about marshmallows. So, hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. So without further ado, climb out of your couch, get over your food coma. The turkey has passed. Now let's talk sci-fi. The so, marshmallows are still here. The marshmallows are still here. So, Jeremy Spires, can you introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, I'm Jeremy Spires, like he just said, uh, author of the Ashes of Eternity series and owner, founder of Spires Productions. All right. And uh, how high is Spires Production? How high is it? Yeah, does it go to the sky, the spire? That was supposed to be funny. It didn't sound funny when I said it out loud. All right, we'll move on. JR, remember. People keep telling women this is six inches. So if I tell them it's funny long enough, they'll laugh. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> I'm breaking Jeremy. Oh, all right. <laughs> all right. So um, do you need a breather? Do a shot of tequila, something to recover from uh, from her. Uh, no, I'm all right. I got my back. coffee. That's that's part of the problem. I've had too much. <laughs> All right, so the next part of the introduction, dear listeners, how we first found them. So uh, I actually met Jeremy through the Galaxy's Edge uh, fan club, where he is an active member, and um, we BS over all the things nerdy and military. Um, but I understand, Doc, you probably met him at a bar, because that's where you meet all the cool people, right? I don't think he's been to any bars that I've been at of late. It's, I don't I mean, go it's to been... bars. So I just run them at DragonCon. And so that means most authors she knows she met there. So it's 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 a running joke. She meets everyone at a bar, but she doesn't go to meetings, so it's okay. I don't do meetings. That's why I do podcasts. There you go. So we're like your therapy hour. Good God, help us all. <laughs> Wait, does that mean we get paid? Because I hear therapists make good money. I have no idea. Can you I don't know. You're if you're getting paid, then I need to get up my salary. <laughs> all right. So, Doc, the religion question. Let's get this back on track. Okay, arrival, signs of war of the signs or war of the worlds. There's arrival. a comment in there. Hands down. Arrival. What was that? Arrival. Absolutely arrival. That was an excellent film. What is it you liked about it? Um, for one thing, I the cinematics were beautiful. That was that was a big part of it. The cinematics were really good. The acting was really well done. Um, the concept and theory that aliens would need to teach us something to help them in the future is actually really clever. Um, it implies um, a higher technology, a lot of time travel, and just kind of an overall grander view of the universe, which is something that humans definitely lack overall. And that really interested me and kept me riveted, really. Yeah, but I don't know. I, I enjoyed it, but I also didn't enjoy that one. There was a certain aspect of it that reminded me very much of a short story I once read on um, Time, but it, it was an enjoyable movie. I liked that it it had a lot more thought in it than most first contact movies do. So yeah, it definitely had a lot more a lot more played out um, acti activity. I can't talk this morning. Sorry. So. so for me, it would have been War of the Worlds only because the history of the actual, like, that goes behind the movie with the radio drama and they didn't tell people it was a radio drama. So people really thought that was real. Yeah. Uh, when what, they were listening to the it? radio. Was it, uh, what was his name? Uh, who are I want to say Orwell and I know that's wrong, but who was that? Orson Scott? No. 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 H.G. Uh, Wells. Thank you. Thank you. My God, I just drew a blank. I think what's so impressive about War of the Worlds is it has H.G. Wells wrote a very long time ago, and it has managed to age still fairly well with a few updates along the way. It yeah. was written in 1897. So really? it's almost as old as you, Jr. Almost. Almost. It's a few more years. Probably not as much arthritis, though. <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. But it's not service-connected, so it's okay. Yeah, it never is. <laughs> No, never is. So, on to the polytheistic aspect: the Mummy, Van Helsing, or Sleepy Hollow. 
Oh, that's a really tough one. Can I pick multiples? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to have to go with Mummy and Sleepy Hollow. Um, why Sleepy Hollow? Because Christina Ricci is hot. Um, everyone <laughs> thinks so, I think. Um, but also the... I guess the religious aspect of it wasn't as uh, powerful. It wasn't like the God, God versus the devil. It was just, you know, evil versus good. And it wasn't even really good. It was just like evil versus uh, curiosity. Uh, the mummy, because I mean, come on, it's Emotep, right? Like everybody's read something about Emotep and, you know, the overall Egyptians view of space and the stars, the way they built their temples, pyramids, I guess we would call them. But I mean, Aliens, just yeah, absolutely all the, the stuff that they channel? did. I'm sorry, what? Aliens wrote them, don't you watch, or built them. Didn't you watch the History Channel? Oh, yeah, I always, I mean, you know. But only if you watch it after dark. T-Rex has served in World War One too, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and so, because we know his wife listens, we just want you to know that he did say that you were hotter than all of them, though, right before we get on air. It wasn't his fault that we didn't hit the start button in time. So Are please don't make him sleep on the couch. She's the one who says that Christina Ricci's hot, so, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, then you're okay. I was trying to help you out there, brother. Trust me, my wife, she's she is the main the secondary main character of my books, and she knows how I see her. Oh, well, that is good. So did you not like um, Van Helsing at all? No, I didn't. I never did. I, I've never been big into the vampires and the werewolves. And I mean, I, I understand like I uh, understand why a lot of people are, but I just don't like it. I, I just think it's silly. I'm pretty OK with them as long as they don't sparkle. <laughs> I got a good story about that. I'm gonna have to tell you sometime. Glitter, oh, glitter, cool. glitter is a crafting STD. Yes, it is. It's like the herpes of the craft world. It, it absolutely is. So, which was your first love, sci-fi or fantasy? Sci-fi. I've I've read all of the Tolkien books that are, I guess, what would you call it, uh, mandatory if you want to be a writer. It does but, seem to be so. Yeah, but I'm not a huge fan. I, uh, excuse me for just a moment. I need to, uh, okay. Sorry, I need to check a text message. It seemed important. I'm not a big fantasy fan. I, I never was big into orcs and goblins and stuff like that. And I say that with a addendum that I was never really big into that until I was older. Um, and more recently than I'd like to admit when, uh, Nick and Jason released the uh, Wargate books, Forgotten Ruin. Absolutely incredible. So I started getting into those. My first love of sci-fi uh, was started when I was about three years old. So, you know, in ancient history, uh, my dad actually rented um, A New Hope from Blockbuster. Again, dating myself. So uh, I, found my I sat down and watched it with recently. him at three and I can still remember how exciting it was. And I asked him if there was another one like that. And he said, yeah. And he went and we, he went back to Blockbuster the same night and ran into uh, Empire and Return of the Jedi. And I'll tell you what, I, I fell in love with that. I must have watched. I mean, then I think the next year dad bought it for me, uh, you know, like the, the trilogy set. And I think I probably watched that eight or nine hundred times. The tapes actually broke and uh, I had to get a new set. So. <laughs> I've always sure. kind of been in love with sci-fi after that. Nope, that's awesome. So what is it that you love about sci-fi? Uh, I love the adventure aspect. I love the science aspect behind it. Like uh, on the adventure aspect, you know, you know, Luke and Leia and stuff like that doing their missions and trying to save the galaxy was always interesting. But it was, at the same time, it was like there was more lore behind it. You could tell there was more like, OK, you're talking you're, we're talking a story about three people in the galaxy, but there's more than that, obviously. So, um, yeah, I, I like that. And then uh, I really like the science part. Like, you know, I started falling in love with Star Trek and, you know, they would it wasn't just about, you know, military stuff. It wasn't just about fighting wars. It was about, you know, spatial anomalies that, uh, you know, mirror universes and that kind of thing. The multiverse just really got me going into a lot of that stuff really heavily, more heavily than I'd like to admit. <laughs> no shame. <clears throat> so how did your love of speculative fiction, so sci-fi, fantasy, horror, the whole umbrella, um, transition into you writing stories in this space? Okay, well, that's actually a good, yeah. <laughs> so basically what happened was, is I, I rented a book from the library in uh, in Washington when I lived there. And I don't remember what it was called anymore because it was so bad. I read uh, the first eight chapters of it and I threw it against the wall because I was so mad. And 
there was two problems with it. First of all is uh, humans were complete underdogs and they were just getting railed by every alien species in the galaxy. And the second part was, is the writing was just, it was so pretentious. And that's the only way I can describe it. It was pretentious. It was like this author thought he was better than the reader and he knew it and he was going to make sure everybody knew that. And I, I just, I looked at my wife and I said, you know, this book is terrible and I could do better. And she says, you know, either put up or shut up. And if you think you could do better then do it better. And I was like, well, I probably can't do it better, but I'm going to do it anyway. So <laughs> I wrote my first book and, you know, it, it was uh, one of those things where I absolutely refused to allow, um, the, to follow the idea that humans were always going to be an underdog. Like at some point in our history, we're going to be stronger and better. And my children is casting to the television standby a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Electronics, everybody's I, friend, and the bane of every parent's existence. Yeah, it's it's really not. There we go. <laughs> so, <clears throat> sorry did you that, end up doing anything with that first novel you write, or did you just trunk it? Um, no, actually, I um, I turned it into a short story, and I published it on uh, fanfiction.net, if you can believe that. Um, and that's kind of where I got my original start. It was the reviews there that actually led me into novel writing um, and the, eventually the self-publishing world because everyone laughed at me when I tried to submit a, uh, uh, submit a manuscript to them and they all kind of laughed at me. The only one who wanted to reach out was Vanity Publishers and I wasn't interested in that. So I started looking into the self-publishing with Kindle and whatnot and that's how I got where I am now. <laughs> It's never a good idea to tell a ranger they can't do something. It just generally encourages them to do more. Um, that's basically my whole life philosophy. It's like if you tell me I can't or you're la you're going to laugh at me, then I'm going to make you look stupid because that's my goal. <laughs> I've done that a lot. It's, oh, I, I mean, it's, it's exciting. Stubbornness. Oh, yeah. It's very it's exciting. Done. And then they stand there and they look at you and they're like, Hmm. Maybe I should have uh, been nicer. Like, yeah, maybe you should have. Now you have no more chances to do that. So many authors let their own real life experiences influence the stories they tell. So were there any specific formidable moments that you feel like shaped you as a storyteller? Oh my God. So many, <laughs> <laughs> some of them, I can't even begin to, uh, some of them I can't even begin to tell you, but yes, a lot of my military experiences, uh, find their way into my books. Um, some of them good, some of them bad, uh, particularly in my third, uh, the third book of the Ashes of Eternity series, um, Night Stalkers, that's called. Uh, I go pretty deep into the world of uh, veteran suicide and things like that, because that's something that's kind of near and dear to me. <clears throat> is that any relation to the um, 160th SOAR, which is the uh, Night Stalker helicopter unit? It is. Uh, they are the main inspiration for the main unit in that book, because I believe the 160th is hands down the best unit in the military. And the Marines. Really, you've never heard of the 501st. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's a playback to his Star Trek roots or Star Wars roots. I'm sorry. It was a joke. I, I said the real military. I'm not talking was, about stormtroopers because they hey, can't hey. hit. <laughs> 501st is actually a real army unit. I know that. <laughs> I, had the, I wasn't uh, going to insult the army. Come on. They're not Marines. I, I had the, uh, the um, pleasure of being in the Brigade Support Battalion 501st. Nice. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was All right. Mess, so, if you want to give the inter-service rivalry hate mail, send it to <laughs> Seska at Blasters and Blades Podcast at gmail.com. <laughs> and uh, she'll be happy to read through all of that for you and pass it on to the appropriate authorities. There you speaking go. Of the, uh, speaking of the military, so you mentioned that you served in the U.S. Army. So we ask all of the authors that we interview who are also veterans, how do you feel like your time in uniform affects the stories you tell? I had a lot of time to think about it. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> Hurry up and wait. Hurry up and think about it. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the one thing people don't realize about the military in general and war specifically. It's a whole lot of waiting for the exciting stuff to happen, but mostly you're just bored. Yep, pretty much. Yeah. That's why the stupid shenanigans happen, because what else are you going to do when you're 18 and full of energy? Exactly. And, and then you hear even, you know, even years later, you still hear half right face and you're just like, ah, well, I deserve it. 
That is the, uh, for those that didn't serve, that is the position when you're standing in formation to make it. No, so no, everyone no. Can that is not the position. That is getting ready for the position of being in pain. That's, yeah, it, that's, that's. Yeah, it maneuvers position. everyone so there's room for them to go and do push-ups. Exactly. And that is. I heard absolute... that a lot in my eight and a half years <laughs> in the Army. I know everybody I, I surprised. I swear I can still close my eyes and hear the counting that followed it. So can I. So I actually did that to my kids uh, when I. That's uh, parenting done right. Yeah. Well, they would they would get mouthy with me or something like that. And I would I would just tell them to get on their faces and push. And they stopped uh, getting mouthy with me after that. I, uh, I, I respect that. I can't watch my son do push ups because my inner the voice of my drill sergeant wants to come out. That's yeah. I still hear, <laughs> you know, they did it right when you can still hear them in your head sometimes. Like uh, every time I'm lecturing my kids <laughs> that they need to drink more water, I hear him drink water. Oh heat, my God. Sergeant, Thanks for saying heat. that, JR. I'm going to have nightmares. <laughs> but he likes to share his pain. Yeah, we, oh, I do. That's why I write. It's therapy. Only you pay me for it when you buy my books. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm sure Jeremy will feel the same way when he makes his first billion dollars because I'm sure that's coming. But uh, don't forget the little people when you when you rise up to the top. So I'm gonna do you, try. <laughs> do you ever draw from people you knew when you were in when you write? Oh yes, oh yeah, a lot. Um, matter of fact, some of those drill sergeants even uh, they had some pretty interesting stories. Older guys, you know, that were uh, you look at them, they're kind of gray haired, and at first, you know, you might think, eh, you know, this guy can't do nothing, but then you see him, and you're just like, usually guys die young in the army. So if you got gray hair and you're older, you probably got some interesting stories. So. I would uh, I'd make it a point and sit around and listen to what they had to say because they always had something interesting. Um, but our, yes, our favorite chaplain was that guy. Oh yeah, like, he, like, uh, he's got the he's got the Tower of Power, and it's like, wait, you're stacking bodies in the Lord's name, damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, no, no, because he hadn't started as a chaplain. Yeah, exactly. And you get a lot of really good one-liners from your time in the military. I had a few, but those. not as many. I don't remember as many, unfortunately. Uh, my memory is a little slippery sometimes. So yeah, mine too. But my favorite was the um, when we were doing the training. When I was at the, uh, I was at Infantry OSA, and we were at the Infantry phase of it. And he was like, "You privates, all you want to do is eat, sleep, shit, and use up." Oh my god, damn toilet paper! And I'm like, "That's my kids." That's my kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So I don't, yeah. The one thing it made me realize, though. Uh, there were a couple of close calls in Iraq and you would think, well, in the movies, they always had those great one-liners, like when this stuff happens. I'm like, that doesn't really happen. You say the dumbest things. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I Yeah. <laughs> I got a few of those, but that's definitely an on off-air story. Yeah, I just remember thinking a couple of times, I'm like, if I was going to do that again, I'd want to go in there knowing what was going to happen so I could come up with something cooler to say because that was just dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So when you draw from people that you knew, do you change the name or do you do you give them full credit and let them know? Um, <clears throat> well, that's uh, that depends, because some of my friends are uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Some of my friends are passed on. And uh, so I would give them credit if I were still able to or I would tell them. Um, but many of my characters in my books are uh, formerly living people who uh, did incredible things and their stories get told in a different way. And then uh, they get the recognition that I don't feel they got in life. I'm a firm believer that as long as we keep their memory alive, they don't really die. I lost exactly. a lot of friends along the way that way. So if you're listening to this, you're, this is airing on the 26th. And so there is still time to contribute through Galaxy's Edge. If you go to their website, we talked about this on Veterans Day, but the Mission 22 project to prevent some of those um, those suicides from, from happening because uh, I lost too many friends that way too. So that's something all of us here are passionate about. So if that's something you feel so inclined, it's not too late to donate and see uh, if we can't make a difference. So, Absolutely. Do you ever draw on any of the people you served with that you didn't like and be like, ha -ha, I'm going to show you corporal, lieutenant, whoever. I Unofficially the off the book, of course. <laughs> oh, off the books in that case. Yes. Uh, 100%. There, there's people that uh, get registered all the time. Sometimes even <laughs> bad reviewers. I like that. I never. I've been that told that is the best part of writing as an author. Oh my god! <laughs> I mean, they so, do it a little differently in the UK. There was one guy who got a bad review. He tracked her down and like brained her with a bottle. What? <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, it was a it was an indie author in the UK. 
who he was in uh, near London and he traveled all the way to somewhere in Wales to like beat up this lady who gave him a one star. Which I mean, I can't condone that behavior. I think that guy needs a little therapy. Well, he's probably getting it in jail. So uh, you know what? As my school sergeant once said, "Ask." There are three things everybody's got in common: assholes, elbows, and opinions. And all those things should be kept to themselves. Yep, exactly. So that's right up there for me with the uh, the guy that got stabbed by his coworker at the North Pole or the Arctic, whatever one of those uh, stations where they were doing research because he spoiled the ending. So the, his neighbor had enough. Yeah, I actually yeah. understand that a little bit better. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I mean, I don't, if I was the judge there, I don't think I could vote to convict. That's for sure. <laughs> All no right. way. Like, totally, so, uh, totally understand. Now, yeah. I will say there is a certain aspect of there's a spoiler window where after that, like, definitely you're in and like reading it is, you know, and spoiling is kind of a, a dick move. But after, like, if it's a movie that's inherently in pop culture, like Endgame, you know, you can't expect somebody a year and a half later to know that you haven't seen it. Yeah, like sure. De- Walking Dead. Walking Dead was always a big one with spoilers. I, and... I got cussed out af- at work for spoiling the ending. It was two years, almost a, two years after Endgame had come out. I'm like, yeah, and how can you possibly, how can you reasonably be expected to keep something like that? Come on, I mean, yeah, yeah. Sure. first two months, totally get it. Yeah, thirty days, thirty days. Yeah. You now, if you think somebody's us. actively reading the book, that's another story. Like, if yeah. you're like, hey, I haven't read Harry Potter. I'm reading it for the first time. And they're actively reading the book. Yeah. Keep your mouth shut. Yeah. I mean, that's only courtesy, though. I mean, but just walk around and be like, oh, yeah, by the way, Snape does this. It's like, oh, come on. Really? Like, come on. Uh, I have a friend who uh, got threaded at a con for wearing. There's a shirt and it came out like 48 hours. I guess the printer sped red. The Dumbledore dies on page whatever. And two years later, somebody screamed at her at a convention for wearing it. Wow. <laughs> okay. So you talked about how the time in the uniform affects the way you tell stories and the kind of characters you put in there. How does it affect you as a reader or a consumer of content since you've seen parts of the world most people never have and parts of humanity as well? Do you think it affects the way you engage content? You know, that would be a really good question for my wife to answer, and she would be able to go off on several tangents about how I destroy movies, books, and other media, because uh, I'll be like, you know, that couldn't happen. This wouldn't happen here. This is why. Why didn't you reload your rifle? You couldn't do that. You can't drop your rifle in the sand. So, yeah, it's affected me negatively. <laughs> your rifle in your sa- in the sand, bad guy. Yeah, and the dust cover. I'm sorry. No, close your damn dust cover. You're letting everything dude, right. Get in like that barrel. just drives me nuts. Like, dude, you're not gonna you're not gonna pick up a magazine out of the sand, bang it on your helmet, and start firing. Like, it's not gonna work. <laughs> you're gonna destroy. It looks it right good on TV, life. but it destroys the springs on the the magazine as well. Well, yeah, and I mean, not to mention you're putting sandy rounds inside. I mean, even the bullet itself trying to go down the barrel is gonna destroy it because you know friction coefficients and shit like that. But I mean. Yeah, don't get me going on that one. I, I go all day. Oh, I totally yeah. understand. And, and the other one is they clearly never understand the concept of supply and how they are the bane of our existence because they're like oh. just dropping magazines and just leaving them. I'm like, no, no, no. You got to turn that shit in when it's over. Or, or you know, your TA50 gear. Oh, oh yes. my God. Don't even, don't even get me started. Like, oh, I just I just destroyed this magazine pouch. I'm just going to rip it off and throw it on the battlefield. Like, yeah, you're going to pay for that later, buddy. Like. Yes, 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 yes. You know what yeah, I, I remember... refer to as Hot Fuzz? Have you ever seen that movie Hot Fuzz with Simon uh, Pegg? No. Absolutely, hands down, one of the best cop movies, and it's a comedy, of course. And they're watching him and one of the other characters watching Point Break, which excellent movie with Keanu Reeves. Uh, Simon Pegg says to Danny, his, co- oh, his buddy or whatever, uh, police officer, he says, you know, I won't deny that it's a no-holds-barred action thriller, but he couldn't do that without accumulating a tremendous amount of paperwork. And that's really like, that's exactly how I feel about all of that. So when we were, when we were overseas, we were relieved by an air force unit. So we were doing our last official mission and we're turning everything in to, to certify the new unit. It's like, they're good to go. And the the weirdest thing is, so in in the army, if you put a chamber of the round and you don't fire it, you don't put it back in the magazine because you don't know you could have dented it or whatever. You cause yourself a misfire. It's a dead round. They wanted us to account for, and every course, every time you go in and out of a base, you're pulling rounds in and out of the chamber because you go hot when you're on out of the fob and stuff. When we got back, they're like, we want you to count every single round and we need you to fill out a form for every round that's missing. 
and I'm like, you have got to be shitting me. Yeah, this is like supply on steroids. That's the shit that they don't show on TV. And no, so of course my uh, my platoon sergeant was old school. So he's like, yeah, we're just gonna go try fire somewhere. And the next thing you know, everybody fired every round they had. All gone. Nice, love it. <laughs> so anything we lost, oh no, we just fired it. Honest, you didn't hear us. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that's the kind of stuff. Those little details they never get right in in content. Or they just leave that when they leave the person, they're like, no, no, there's a lot of equipment, right? Like that's ammo you could pass on to the living. Like, why are you just leaving that shit? Like that, that's all yep. usable. I think the, the only... closest, uh, the closest movies that have got, I mean, even remotely close are John Wick. Of course, those movies are yes. excellent. And uh, Black Hawk Down is pretty close to about as accurate as it really gets. Yeah. That ringing, ooh, that still gets me because I, I can feel that one. The uh, the cool thing okay, about John Wick wait, is if you- Wait, wait, wait. The, I have to explain if anybody is watching this, why I laugh because people get upset when I laugh about Black Hawk Down, which is the entire situation, not funny. But in Medic AIT, they literally pull up clips of Black Hawk Down and going, and this is what is wrong. Yeah. So that is because there's so much medical in, in, in a theater type situation going on in Shonen Black Hawk Down, which is why they do it, which is also now why I laugh when people talk. Yeah, about because that. most, of, like, yeah, most of the medical things. But I guess I understand it. We because... call it Hollywood medicine for a reason, and they're like, right. Like, my instructor was like, and that's how you give somebody an infection that can cost them their life. Yes, exactly. But I suppose that you don't want to scare off the audiences either by showing, you know, real life soldiers, you know like so, real injuries and stuff but so yeah. i've actually worked with a publisher and i put in there in my first novel stuff that really happened to me that i won't won't talk about on air because it would lose the family friendly rating but i remember him saying like you've you've got to take that out that's not believable you got to keep it somewhat realistic i'm like what are you talking about that actually happened to me because well i don't care they're not going to believe that jr so take it out <laughs> yeah and so that's one of those things sometimes you've got to you've got to edit the truth because the truth is stranger than you fiction can't handle the never truth. Believe you. that's right so, and I, I it's one of things. yeah, that's one of the things they did get right though was the ringing in your ears with all the noise like that. That was spot on. Oh my god! So <laughs> I did, I did enjoy it. But all so, right, Doc, you get to ask your favorite questions. I get to ask the fandom questions because they're fun. So we're changing the pace of the show to fun stuff. The weirdest and funniest story you've ever had with a since you've started writing, interacting with a fan. Oh boy weirdest or funniest let's see which one uh let's let's go with weird first so uh there's a gentleman that i know uh it's part of a few groups that i'm a part of unfortunately and uh <clears throat> he uh he frequently will send me messages that are very random and the other day i finally was like okay i gotta ask you like, why do you why do you do this and he says well i just really love your books so much and i'm like okay but i only have like three four books out bud like I understand that you enjoy them, but what, what's going on with this? He's like, well, maybe I just have a really good big crush on you. I'm like, yeah, we're going to go ahead and um, we're going to go ahead and hit that block button right now. Uh, that was definitely the weirdest interaction I've had with anybody so far. Uh, the funniest was um, I was talking to a guy and uh, this just happened uh, the last week in Vegas. I was talking to a gentleman and he was telling me all about my books. And I don't think, uh, I don't think he realized that he was talking to the author of those books because I had my name tag uh, spun around. It was face and my name was facing my shirt. So he's going on and on. Tell me about how great these books are. And I'm just like standing there smiling. I'm like, wow, this is awesome. And finally, I was like, you know who I am, right? And he's like, well, no, I flip my name tag around. I'm like, hey, look, you know, oh, man, he got so excited and had a copy of the book. I got to autograph it for him. That was pretty, but that was probably the funniest, most interesting interactions I've had. But uh yeah, the other the other fellow, he's uh that was very interesting. <laughs> there, there are fans, and then sometimes fans, as much as they love you, they still blow past the boundary, the comfort boundary. Way this, past. in the south, we just say, bless your heart. We say something they have... in Alaska too, but it's it has a lot more four-letter words. So we're gonna go ahead and I was gonna that. ask you that if they had an Alaskan equivalent, or do you just hide oh, the body sure in the snowdrift? Or do they just hide the body in the snowdrift? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I can, I can, can neither confirm nor deny that. So <laughs> is it true that to graduate high school up there, you got to wrestle a moose? So, uh, polar bear. what? Well, it's a polar. I asked him if he had to wrestle a moose to graduate high school. He said, no, it's a polar bear. I was wrong. <laughs> well, bear, you are wrong. And that's why we have the hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, back on track, Doc. 
Is there, uh, can you give us the reader's digest of everything that you have um, written? Sure. So uh, I have the Ashes of Eternity series, uh, the main series, which is uh, Shockwave, Requiem of a Nightmare, and Night Stalkers. And I swear there's only two pretentious titles in the whole book series. I promise there's only one that's really pretentious. And uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. Uh, anyways, I have that series. And then uh, we have the novella series that are coming out, which uh, it's another... Um, <clears throat> It's another series inside the series where they're not really novellas. They're actually um, main series. They're, I mean, let me start over. So main series starts and we skip ahead 6,000 years, right? So I decided I was going to take these, uh, take these novellas and fill in that 6,000 year time period between the main series and these. So it kind of gives the readers a little bit more opportunity to uh, world build and learn the characters and learn, you know, the, the history of the wars and why they happened. Um, right now, uh, I've got one of them is done uh, from an author named Stephen Kanichi and me. Um, it's done. I have to send it to my editor. And I've been a little busy with my own project, so I haven't really gotten around to it. Sorry, Steve. I swear it's coming. I swear. Um, and then I have a standalone novel that's uh, going to be a three-part series called Child Soldier. That one is a psychological thriller that follows a kid named Jeremy Edwards. Uh, no pun intended. I uh, Just somebody I knew back in the day got... The, the honor of being named that um <clears throat> that one is really intense really psychological like i said uh definitely not for kids um, a lot of mayhem sex drugs rock and roll that sort of thing so that's uh that's what's coming there and then there's a total of eight main series ashes of eternity books there's three out right now i'm working on number four um that one was supposed to come out the first of december but work and uh another project that I'm not allowed to talk about uh, for NDA reasons. Um, that one had to come first. So, well, we, but we'll expect it soon, right? Uh, I'm, I'm hearing December. That's what I'm hearing. So yeah, I got to hurry soon up. And being relative. What's that? Soon being relative. Like, no, like I'm actually hearing three December. Months. So I'm, I'm, I'm hearing okay. middle of December is when they're going to try and release it. So. Awesome. That is, sounds like a lot of, a lot of stuff to go on, but we are here to focus on Shockwave, Ashes of Eternity, book one. How did you come up with the premise? For, well, first, what is the premise? And then how did you come up with it? Expired MREs, my chair is popping up the wrong hashtags, uh, not enough sleep. Yes, all of the above. And most of it, no, I'm just kidding. It's not JR's fault at all. So, okay, um, basically, this is this is a funny story. The main character's name is Destota Valentine. Destota started out as, uh, when I was a teenager, I was super nerdy, of course, because we all are. Um, I was engaged in uh, turn-based online role-playing on message boards for Star Wars. And it was so geeky when I look back on it. Now I'm just like super cringe. But See, uh, Destota, you didn't have good spelling to do that back in the day. I did. I, well, I, was I have horrible spelling, so I never did those. <laughs> I, I was homeschooled. My mom was really big on spelling. So uh, thanks for that, mom. Awesome. Um, but uh, basically what ended up happening is I built this character and uh, played the character for years. You know, you work up through Jedi Apprentice all the way up to Jedi Master, blah, blah, blah. Go on space opera adventures. That's kind of, uh, you know, just mm -hmm. the fun of it. So that character was born there. And as I got older, I was realizing how dorky it was. And I was like, I really want to, but I really want to do something. This character is so great. I want to build something really interesting. So um uh, in the early 2000s, a uh, video game Halo came out, and that was big interest for me. So I started playing that, and I was like, you know, this is this is good. Like, I like this military sci-fi action a little bit. And the more I, the more I like, the or the more I dug into that world, the more I started building the Distota character to be more of a instead of a Jedi, a super soldier. So I, uh, I actually wrote the first iteration of that. It's called Shadow of Eternity. It's terrible. Don't read it. Um, mm -hmm. It's pulled off the shelves. I think I have like one copy left on my shelf. It's just so bad. But anyways, um, I wrote that and I I liked the premise of the book. But the problem was that I had spent 15 years building it. And so it was stop and start. It was new ideas getting thrown in, go back and edit. And it was terrible. And so I decided I was like, you know, what? no, I'm going to scrap the whole project. I'm going to scrap the name of the series. I'm going to go everything brand new. And I built Shockwave. And. The book title is actually named after one of the super destroyers in the book, which is the battleship shockwave. And 
it just it kind of bloomed into this whole thing um the original uh character was like completely unstoppable you know you just do anything and it was a little silly and i got to thinking about it more and i was like you know we need to add more of a human element so Justota got written back quite a bit on how strong he actually was how what he was able to do um still an excellent fighter still an excellent shot really good you know i mean a hyper ranger right so mm -hmm. that was that was gone in that book. And then I also added uh, the character Mallory, who is uh, Destota's one true love. And like the only real humanity that he actually has is his wife and kids. And that Mallory is based on my wife, which we were chatting about earlier. And it's uh, it became like this iteration of how I see my wife, which is, you know, complete goddess level or so far above me kind of thing. And then all of a sudden it just ran away. Like the entire, the project just ran away from me. And I, when I say it ran away from me, I do mean quite literally. I mean, there was so much that wasn't supposed to happen and I was only going to write two books and I was only going to write three. And now I'm like, well, why am I going to stop now? Like they're selling no big deal. So <laughs> that's kind of where that happened. And it's uh, the, the premise is basically um, like I hit on earlier with the humans being so underpowered. So humanity is not underpowered. They suffer defeats like everybody does, but they are badasses in the galaxy. They built the biggest ships. They built the strongest weapons. And basically everybody just leaves humans alone because they're scary. They're scared to death of them. And I won't go into too many spoilers, but there is a lot of uh, twists and turns that uh, uh, focuses on the religious element of it. And a lot of people think that the religious element in the first book is me hating on God and religion and stuff. And it's not. It's the exact opposite. Um, so the main enemy is called the Felb, the Empire of the Felb, and it's based solely on corruption, <clears throat> right? So, you know, uh, I'm not going to go into naming names, but there are certain individuals within the world now that we live in that are corrupt beyond reason. And that's what that hits on. You know, it's not about religion. It's not about God. It's not about anything like that. It's about people using those things to further their power, which is something I am very much against in the world. So that's what that hits on and then they start a civil war and it just spirals out of control the war ends and then come to find out there's aliens out there that have been kind of poking humans to try and go in the opposite direction from what they are and trying to make them fight so they're weaker and it just uh i don't follow tropes and i hate that word trope so <laughs> i i like just Everyone's always asking me, they're like, well, do you know what's going to happen in the next book? I'm like, no, I'm just as surprised as you are most of the time. So <laughs> I mean, you're a pantser then really when you write, not a plotter. Nope. I have a basic outline that I know where things are going to happen. Like, uh, you know, I know what, which book is going to contain what, but that's it. Everything else is just. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that there's been some great books that come out like that. I will admit one of my favorite friends I talked to one time and. It was so much funny. I wish I'd gotten it on film. They were completely a organized person about everything. Like their outline was like, okay, just turn it into a sentence. And then they had one series and it's their series that took off. And it was everything just all of went wacko. And then listening to them vent about that was quite fun. Oh yeah. It's just a blast. I, I much prefer, I much prefer doing it that way than, um, outlining everything that's how child soldier ended up being as crazy as it was <laughs> so um can we put the book cover up jr so we can talk about that for a few minutes because that is a super awesome book cover there's lots of orange in it which i think i think it'll stand i think that makes it stand out on a bookshelf though because yeah, the one I sent there is actually uh, the audio cover, too, which uh, was the highest resolution one I actually had on me at the time. Um, yeah, the orange wasn't something that was actually supposed to happen, but it just kind of went together. And uh, I will say um, this is the first time anyone's going to hear about it other than the artist, but I'm actually rebuilding the covers for all of the Ashes of Eternity books right now. Um, we're actually going to get to see the characters' faces, so we're not going to do the Master Chief thing anymore. <laughs> So we can, can I show? Hello? Oh yes, by all yeah. means, please do. So this is, so this, is uh, this is another one of our novella series. This is Void Jumper, and uh, as you can see, it's written by Angela Watts. Um, this is going to be kind of uh, one of those things where I guess you could say uh, it's—I don't want to say it's progressive or woke because it's not—but um, 
something a little different that I wanted to do. Uh, this is a female character written by oh, um, a really awesome female writer, and it's going to be narrated by Catherine Porter. So nice. we kind of we kind of wanted to hit that whole female angle of sci-fi a little bit too. So as a female, I totally approve. Oh well, thank you. <laughs> some of my favorite books are have female leads, and then some of my favorite books do not. So I mean, yeah. it. But they're they are an entire. There, it's the lar female veterans are the largest growing demographic of veterans out there. I agree. And, and, no, no, that's statistics actually. Oh, I actually yeah. know that. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, that's actually statistically. So it is very important that we make sure in literature that women can also see these characters too. Oh because yeah, because you're not going to get into it if you if it's just all men. Like I mean, okay, like you said, some of your favorites are with men, and but if you have books with strong female characters or focused female characters, then it's I think it's much better. You're hitting a you're hitting a an important part of our market and everything right there. So yeah, and if you're talking about books that are showing you a world and a society, well, it needs to show you all of that. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I this like one here. this one. It looks like he's uh, in mop gear almost, or. <clears throat> sniper ghillie suit yeah it is a ghillie suit it. um that is uh that is the cover for makalos makalos is a swedish word it means peerless unrivaled um basically being a badass uh makalos follows a gentleman who is part of the swedish army and uh one of the main things that i didn't want to touch anything to do with in ashes of eternity is nationalism there is no united states there's no great britain there's no nothing everyone fights everybody all the time they're just everyone's jerks to each other so uh, this Swedish sniper is uh, one of the, this actually is going to be like right at the very, very, very lead edge of the war that uh, is fought on earth that eventually causes an entire group of settlers to leave. And this sniper is one of the main um, components of making that happen, of getting humans off world, uh, using a brand new ship that was stolen, using alien technology, but I'm not going to go much more into that. So uh He's gonna he's gonna be kind of a focus in the entire series overall is uh, this gentleman that's pictured in the cover and this what this book is about. So it'll be it'll be interesting in the future, that's for sure. Uh, yes, this one is the one that I was talking about that is done. Malium, it's called. Malium is a Latin word that means evil. Um, this book is set about twenty five hundred years after uh, the settlers leave Earth. And it focuses solely on the enemy side, um, which is the Fell Vampire, and tells their story and explains the depth of corruption and everything. So this one, this book is actually done. I'm planning on releasing it uh, January 13th of 2022. Wow. So not too far away. No, sir. Not too far at all. All right. So we'll go back to the uh, cover of the book we're talking about <clears throat> to make things a little bit easier. So, so let's uh, so talk Let's talk about the book itself. What would your 30 second elevator pitch be for Ashes of Eternity? 30 seconds. I could do it in 10. Archer and Deadpool meet Halo and Starship Troopers. Okay. okay. It's uh it, it's very sarcastic. It's there's nonstop humor. And that's you know, JR, you were there. You know what it's like. Um one of the Irreverent other things I can't stand up. is I'm sorry, what? Irreverent is all get up. Oh yeah. It's just, uh, it's not the way that soldiers are portrayed sometimes in military science fiction is, uh, you know, this upstanding, a stiff upper lip British type. And it's like, no, no, 99% of us are just all jackasses. We're just kids doing dumb things. And, you know, it's one of those things that that's what I wanted to, uh, impress upon all readers of this genre of military sci-fi is it's, it's all a joke. It's all dark humor and running jokes and we screw up constantly. And that's what, uh, that's what Destota is all about. He is constantly screwing up. He's constantly making mistakes, and it's hilarious. And sometimes those mistakes end up being the right thing after all. Yes, absolutely. Sometimes the mistake is the right answer, and sometimes the right answer is something completely off ball, and he fails miserably. And that's part of life and growing up. Yes, and there's uh, there's the other sort of reverse trope of that is, and I think somebody else has done that with, but. You know, if you really want to end a war quickly, you send all the old guys because they got no Fs left to give. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't mind I wouldn't mind playing with that because I took some stupid risks when I was 18 and, and 22 and, and over there the first time. And I'm just thinking if I went at like 
45 when my back is hurt from the from the you know 10 years i spent in the army i'm like yeah i might do things a little different and be a little less forgiving to the locals yeah i yeah definitely would agree with that <laughs> so so there's there's room in there in the in worlds and it sounds like your universe could support something like that yes like the graybeard battalion or something i don't know but um all right so what is it you think makes your series special what makes my series special is uh we're very much what's a good word i don't want to say inclusive but that's basically what it is we uh we strive for a very large um very large population of people that can come in and join in the fun that's what makes this special what also makes it special is like i said we do that and humans aren't underdogs uh and we're we're out here to win and that's that's what humans do in these books is they win all the time even if uh even if they get pushed back a little bit they're gonna win and that's what really counts as far as you know okay um so normally doc gets asked this question so i'm not going to use her ridiculous made-up word but what uh tropes do you feel like shockwave hits the best um well, from all the sales so far and from, you know, the, my market watching, I guess I would say the tropes that it hits are the standard military sci-fi, super soldier, genetic engineering. Um, there's a lot of that, but um, tropalicious. Thanks, JR. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was avoiding it for you. I was trying to let you leave with your manhood intact. Yeah, we all, yeah, I guess. But oh, you're married, uh, so I guess it's a lost cause. Uh, Ow! No. They are. Oh. <laughs> I that don't really like the word trope, to be honest with you. But yeah. uh, I, I follow a lot of the standard military science fiction um, temperaments and stuff like that. Like, if you're a fan of any of the big ones, Galaxy's Edge, uh, Expeditionary Force, uh, what was that? Great. What was that? Uh, Andy Weir one, the Artemis Project. If you're a fan of any of those things, then you'll like these for sure. Okay. So, do you hit any specific subgenres? Is it straight mill SF? Do you military sci fi? Do you mix anything else in? It's military sci fi and space opera ish. And I don't know what would that what would that be called? Like a human 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 condition story, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now in the story itself, what can you tell us about your main character? What makes them unique in the crowded field of science fiction? My favorite topic. Uh, so there are, there are 200 and that's what, uh, that's what starts off the night stalker battalion. As you touched on earlier, JR, the one uh, sixty SOAR. But uh, basically they were given that name because they were chosen at birth. Um, they were chosen at birth. They don't have anything special about them to begin with. They're not, uh, you know, they're not like uh, eugenically bred or anything like that. But they're chosen. And then at birth, they're giving a, given a set of genetic modifications that makes them stronger, smarter, faster. But it comes with severe consequences. So these 200 were created strictly to fight the war against the Feld Empire and to defeat them. The problem was, is that the creators of them didn't see that there was... You know, they didn't expect them to live past 30 was the biggest thing. So um, the Vandorian people, which is the main uh, the main protagonist of Ashes of Eternity, they live into the 500 year range because of their science. But they don't expect these soldiers to live past 30. So they don't anticipate any of that. So that's uh, the Stota of Valentine. He is the first one to experience any kind of uh, negative side effects. And that's where I touch on veteran suicide and things like that in later books. Um, but what makes them special is they're the super soldiers with hearts of gold. They are, they only care about their planet, their people and to their people, to their loved ones, they are angels. You know, they're just, they do everything to protect their families. They do everything to take care of them to their enemies. They're absolute mad dogs. Um, there was a joke in written in the book that I will share uh, where Mallory, the uh, the wife of Destota, says, you know, I heard a story once that you took on 100 Felb soldiers with nothing but a combat knife and a half a ham sandwich. And Destota says, no, of course not. That's a lie. That would never do something like that because there was no ham sandwich. So <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of uh, that's kind of characters they are. And the those 200, um, 
they get beat up pretty badly in the wars um, following the human civil war that I will talk that I won't talk much about because we're only talking about book one. So. All right. So were there any secondary characters that were especially memorable for you? Yes. So um, there are a few. Uh, Michael Kellis, uh, Ivata Noku. Uh, Mike Kellis was a real person who uh, we lost in the Afghan war. Um, Ivata Noku is based on a guy named Reese Caldwell, and he's actually uh, not a veteran in any way, never served, but uh, he's been my best friend for, I don't know, 25 years or something like that. Um, really good guy. So he's based on that. Uh, another guy I used to uh, do that silly Star Wars role playing with. Um, Mallory Valentine, of course, based on my wife. Um, Duquesa Venlent, who is starts out as a good guy and kind of turns into not such a good guy later on. Um, that character was based on uh, my ex. <laughs> um, oh, I'm trying to think. Uh, there, there's uh, oh Peter Stevens. Peter Stevens was actually based on a very good friend of mine from the military um, who survived a lot of things to take his own life. So that's uh, I try to keep him uh, try to keep him alive as much as possible and uh, his memory alive as well. So. Wow. That's deep. Does did you contact his family? Like, did you let them know? Yeah, I did actually. Um... <clears throat> Good. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna try to stay off that topic if you don't mind. Okay. There. So no, no, I understand. I just speaking speaking of characters, and um, and shutting Jr. up at the same time. Woohoo! <laughs> Two birds, one stone. Um, you know what, so, Doc? I'm gonna I'm gonna dock your pay today. I'm like, I, this attitude is just too much. <laughs> I don't know. Wait, you guys that, are getting like, paid? Yeah, <laughs> you're not. Yeah, I'm a JR publishing button. No. <laughs> um. So, if your characters ever met you in a back alley and they knew who you were and the hell you've been putting them through with creating this universe and everything else, how do you think you would fare? I would die. <laughs> Painfully. Uh, yeah yeah no it, it would be slow this soda would string me up and do horrible things to me <laughs> that is fair so uh <laughs> i love how that you're so quick about it i'm dead so uh now i get to ask i'm stealing jr's question Woohoo! so um we like fans sometimes like to know kind of a sneak peek about behind the curtain of or in the kitchen, how the sausage was made. Were there any cool scenes you cut from your final edition of this book and you used elsewhere? Unfortunately, no. That's one I can't give uh, I can't give good advice to because I didn't really cut any scenes out that I wanted to add. Um, everything that I wanted to put in the book is there. Um, I did well. That's not true, actually. Um, there was a couple space battle scenes that I cut out because I thought they might be a little bit too lengthy. I thought they might be a little. Uh, just write waves of missiles and you're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I uh, <laughs> I really like space battles. I like I like blowing things up in space. It's so much fun, but I get a little too long winded sometimes and I didn't want to turn into a Timothy Zahn where everybody was like, dude, get on with it already. You know, so I. Uh, I. Uh... <clears throat> Sorry, so I you, get distracted. So you, so you cut I, some of those. Yeah, I cut some of those out, but uh, all the battle scenes that I wanted were there. Okay, so we're going to kind of switch a bit off of this and in off characters. And now we're going to talk about the world because with sci-fi and genre fiction, speculative fiction, the world is as much a character as any protagonist or named person. So can you tell us a bit of what we can expect from this world? Uh, do you mean the, the world, like the galaxy at large or the planet individually? Yes, there you go. You're helpful, Jr. Thank you. It's well, okay. Let's things. start with let's start with how far in the future are we talking? Six thousand years. Six thousand years from now, yes. roughly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is this a colony that he's from? Essentially, yes. So okay. basically, the world's called Vandor, and I had it first, Disney. Damn you. Um, <laughs> Vandor is uh, based on Norway. Uh, my visits around the world have uh, kind of told me that I like that place the best. So it's based loosely on Norway, if you can imagine the uh, the scenery there. 
a um, little bit higher gravity. So humans are a little bit tougher bone, a little bit stronger muscles, um, nothing too serious. Uh, the galaxy at large, um, not as big as everyone thinks with uh, the Vandorian FTL drives. They're not like uh, Star Trek hyperdrive or sorry, warp drives, whatever the hell they call them. So humans can move around the galaxy a lot more freely. There's a lot of uh, interstellar trade routes with other species that don't really get mentioned until the fourth and fifth books of the series, just simply for uh, logistical reasons, of course. Um, but yeah, the galaxy's not as big as everyone thinks it is when it comes to the Vandorian people. Okay, so. How did you come up with the name for the Vandorian people? Like, how did that? Um, you know, I don't really remember. I'm sorry. I, I I don't actually have an answer to that question. I don't really recall how that happened because it I came up with the name so many years ago. It just uh, it kind of eludes me. I apologize. Oh, that's fine. It's a random off the off the cuff question. And it wasn't. Although, in the I know, I know. So what you got to do is come up with like the standard BS artsy farty literature type question. No, answers. no, he doesn't. No, he does and then not. You can be like, well, I was contemplating the meaning of life. Oh, and yeah. drinking my Chardonnay. I'm sure they drink that. I'm sure they do. I'm sure they drink something like that. Something pretentious. <laughs> 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 All right, Doc. <laughs> so okay. Um, but no, so tell us a bit, like how, what can we expect from the level of technology? Is it mostly biotech or? Yes, there's a lot of biotech, a lot of biotech, actually. Um, humans, uh, humans tend to follow a pattern through history, right? So we start out with spears and then we move to arrows and we move to swords and whatnot. You know, I mean, we, we have our melee weapons, our long range weapons. So from World War One on, we've pretty much used consistently the same kind of weaponry. And that's kind of where I based my estimations of that uh, humans use projectile weapons, um, but they also use directed energy weapons. And the ships of the fleet, it's kind of a combination thereof. You know, we're using 16-inch guns like, uh, like the Missouri had at the same time as we're using particle cannons like the Starship Enterprise has. So we're kind of in the middle of all that, but the biotechnologies are a lot higher. Uh, Destota himself runs around nonstop uh, getting hurt, so he always has... Uh, he, uh, one of the doctors develops medical nanites to inject into him so that he's not <laughs> always on the verge of death, just near it. Um, but that sort of thing is kind of... Uh, kind of the norm in the entire galaxy so the level of technology for the felbs is uh moderated quite a lot because of their religious aspirations they believe that uh, a lot of technology is not of god so they can't use it um they steal a hyperdrive from another species and develop it for their ship so it's really really slow um and that leads them to be less effective and more effective so like you know, instead of one ship showing up and getting its butt kicked, then the entire fleet shows up all at once. And it's a little bit more of a fair fight with Vandorians whose ships are more powerful, that sort of thing. But they probably also allow a little bit more independent command in their over commanders because they can't get back to get all the information all the time. Correct. So. Yeah, no, that's actually so really when neat. You have, when you have um, non-traditional forces like that you know where you cobble together your equipment it does allow you as a creator to get like to to think outside the box when it comes to tactics because like tactics are a yin and a yang as technology developed tactics are counter developed to counter them uh you end up with people trained you know this is what we would do because it makes sense so if you get someone who doesn't have that training they can do all kinds of wacky things that you wouldn't traditionally think of because they don't know it's not possible and exactly. You can factor that exactly. in when you when you set up this situation the way you did. So do it's you play with the warfare. tactics at all, or do you keep it? Yeah, basically. Yeah. If you can imagine it, you can probably make it happen. Do you play exactly. with those tactics, or is it more an action thriller, like the way the story goes? Um, there's a combination. There's not as much. Uh, there's not as much tactical, like heavy tactical actions and things like that. You know, it's not like how do I say, like severely thought out and planned. It's it's more of a. Uh, it's more of a violence of action type situation. Like whatever's happening is kind of what's going to happen. And we have a battle plan, but as everyone knows, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. So we kind of set it based on that, you know, the whole violence of action 
and like oh we were expecting eight ships and 300 showed up so i guess we're gonna fight 300 now so we kind of have to adjust on the fly instead of uh instead of using this one plan and it's the same thing with the ground combat we don't really go with any particular um tactical like military tactical thinking or anything like that it's just a free-for-all just a just a war that as it happens so of all the tech you made for this universe which is the piece of tech you would want the most me personally oh yeah. probably the life extending and um strength enhancers because i could really stop i could i could do with going to the gym without going to the gym constantly That'd so be nice. how would you i was going to ask how would you abuse that and is it by skipping gym day Yes, absolutely. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> to be eight feet tall and 400 pounds of muscle would be just awesome. I mean, nobody would mess with me then, but you know. <laughs> you wouldn't fit in any vehicles either, though, is the problem. I, I drive semis, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, now you've talked a bit about the aliens in your series. Have. Um, what inspired you with the aliens? Was it just weird drawings your kids made or, you know, sleepless okay. nights again? So the, there's the one protagonist or antagonist race is called the Gilbaglians. And they appear in Shockwave and uh, Requiem of a Nightmare exclusively. Um, they are birds and they are actually based on based very loosely on a Star Wars character that I read about in one of the Expanded Universe books. And it was a single character standalone, uh, nothing fancy, but it's a avian species. So they're kind of, uh, you know, hollow boned and they they're mouthy and they think that they know better than everybody else. And like birds, uh, just like birds, they they think that they're <laughs> smarter than everyone and they're not. So uh, Distota gets to lay the smack down on them. And that's uh, that was kind of the main alien race and whatnot. But uh a lot of the other races are products of my imagination and my wife's actually uh there's a race called the storm and it is an insectoid race it is half spider half praying mantis and my wife is terrified of both so she she told me to uh <laughs> i see that doc <laughs> but uh she t I, I asked her i'm like well what would you be most afraid of what would you be most frightened of and she gave me that and i was like okay i'll make it i'll make it happen it's all good <laughs> Yeah, nope. Hard pass. <laughs> so, so what? Um, you mentioned your wife again when you when you talked about your creative process. So, what role does she play when you're writing? How much of it is just you as a writer, and how much and her as the muse, and how much of it is as her almost as a collaborative partner? So, I am a very linear thinker. I can think in a straight line from A to B without any questions. My wife can think from A, Z, D, P, T, Q, and I'm not capable of doing that. So I will get stuck and I'll be sitting here sometimes literally banging my head against my desk and she'll just, I'll, she'll say, well, tell me, tell me what's going on. Explain it to me. And I'll explain it to her. And she says, why don't you do this? And I'm like, God damn it. Why didn't I think of that? You know? <laughs> so uh, in terms of her being my muse, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily she's my muse, but she is uh, like 80% of my creative process also. Oh, that's sweet. Okay. She's just, sure. she's just more clever than I am. That's all it comes down to. I mean, she did pick you. So how clever could she be? What? Wait, what did I say that out loud? You are. <laughs> this it's, is why you're single. Okay. He mocks me relentlessly too. I, I he, always do. He mocks do. me too. So it's all good. Uh, it's, okay. You know, when he's nice to me, then I wonder that he's plotting on me. Exactly. So, so uh, with you mentioned that. Uh, hold on, Doc. So you mentioned that there the series you got four books out and you had plans. So are you thinking like this arc could go on for um, twelve books? Or are you just going to let the story play itself 30? out? Do you have a, a plan? Nope, no plan. Are you going to pull the David Weber and write it into your dead into your dead and have someone else write it too? Probably, yeah, probably something like that. Um, uh, okay. Right now, there's there's a total of eight books planned in the main series. Uh, but like I said, originally, there was only supposed to be two. So, you know, it's one of those things, uh, as long as the readers still enjoy them, as long as people still buy them, uh, obviously, then uh, I'm going to keep writing them. That's a good answer, as long as readers like it. All right. So this uh, interview is clearly winding down, but was there anything we didn't ask you about Shockwave Ashes of Eternity book one? Again, for the listeners, if you want to scribble this down so you can rush out to buy it, Shockwave Ashes of Eternity book one. Uh, is there anything that we didn't ask you that you wanted to tell us before we move on? 
No, I think we covered most of it, actually. It is a fairly short book. So um, you we do have it. audio. Um, it's in all formats. I'm trying to overcome my own uh, my own ineptness when it comes to creating a hardback as well. Um, we have signed copies available on my website. Um, perfect for Christmas shopping. Perfect for Christmas shopping. But uh, So you have time to order it now. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it'll, so, it'll be there on time. So you have Christmas. all the things you have. So audio, ebook, print. Uh, working on hardcover. Yep. Um, are you doing any box sets at any point down the road, like some authors do, where they'll add a new short story or something? I am going to do a box set of the novella series, uh, probably late 2022. We'll get that done. And then uh, I'm planning on doing a five book at a time box set for the main series. So as soon as book five comes out, I'm going to box that one and sell that too. Very cool. Okay. Um, so before we let you go, Jeremy, can you tell listeners how they can find you on the wild, wild interwebs? Oh, absolutely. You can find me on Facebook uh, under Jeremy Spires, or you can find me at my website, jeremyspires.com. Pretty simple. It's right there on the book cover, as you see. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Spires Productions. And the same with, uh, actually, Instagram is, uh, I haven't updated my Instagram yet, so it's at Dreaded Guardian. You can find me there. Um, we have a fan group on Facebook. Uh, that's Ashes of Eternity fan group. Very easy to find. I think we're the only one out there. Um, and then my main Facebook page is uh, facebook.com slash author Jeremy Spires. Okay. Do you have a YouTube or a Patreon that you uh, want to send people to at all? Or um, No, I not yet. <laughs> all right. Give it time. Give it time, people. All right. And you can find us on our website at anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades we are on the twitters at twitter.com backslash sf underscore fantasy underscore show sierra foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show we have an email at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com again that is blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com we promise we answer all of the mail even the hate mail which of course we do forward to doc we make our deal with all that uh, you can support the show on our website at anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades which operates much like a patreon system where you can pledge monthly or you could support us uh, on a reoccurring basis on buymeacoffee.com or excuse me a one-time basis at buymeacoffee.com backslash author jr handley again buymeacoffee.com backslash author jr handley be sure to put in the comment section it's for the podcast i will keep my co-host nick garber and doc seska duly intoxicated they will drink until their liver surrenders never surrender <laughs> All right. Oh, and I, like I, I get to tell you, we are. Yeah, because she's not a quitter. Uh, we are on the face space. So uh, facebook.com backslash groups backslash Blasters and Blades podcast. Again, backslash groups backslash Blasters and Blades podcast. That is where all the shenanigans happen. Uh, Seska and I bicker incessantly, and I try to convince her of the error of her ways that pineapple does not belong on pizza. Yes, it and does. And she's just wrong in committing heresy. Yes. Oh, good God. Why are you sucking up now? It's over. The interview's over. No, I'm telling you. Piece, pineapple absolutely belongs on pizza. Come on, man. Sweet See? and savory. How can you be mad about that? Eh? Did you bribe I him? I am right. Did you bribe him? Nope. Doc, how much did you pay him? I paid him all of my salary from the show. <laughs> Dang it. Net zero. <laughs> <We're both fired. laughs> <We're both fired. laughs> All right, Doc, bring us home. Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. Happy holidays. I hope you enjoy all of them. Uh, for Nick Garber, J.R. Hanley, I'm Seska. This was a Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week, maybe, with our same time, same where. We'll learn to indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom as pizza with pineapple, which makes J.R.'s head go boom. There is no such thing. It is heretical. Yes, it is. It's it's wonderful. Wrong. It's delicious. The ranger really agrees with me. How can I be wrong? They've had too much.